All right, this is our last session. It's on hiring and firing without liability. And our speakers are uh, Jerry Richardson and Michelle Simak. Michelle is a senior associate that does primarily workers' compensation um, in Missouri, but she also does Illinois also. And she's in our St. Louis office. And Jerry is a member and a, um, he was in our labor and employment law department. And anybody who wants to hear the Notre Dame fight song at the happy hour, Jerry will stand up on a chair and be glad to sing it for you. So yeah. without further ado, I will let them finish or complete their performance. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, as she said, I focus my practice on the defense of workers' compensation claims. Jerry focuses his practice really on labor and employment, helping employers manage problems in their relationships with their employees. The idea behind this segment really was to highlight two areas of the law that can occasionally intertwine or meet up and where you might imagine those two things happening. You know, in, in the last year, how many times have I called Jerry about an issue? Maybe one or two, but when I, when I do have to pick up the phone and, and call him, it's on a very important issue. And so this is sort of a presentation that we were hoping to uh, educate you and arm you with tools to allow you to better follow your gut and your intuition when it comes to managing employee relationships, um, when it's important to get that legal advice. I was thinking better call Saul, but then I was worried like about the uh, implications that you might associate with our professional relationships, and, and that's, that's not at all what it is. So better call Michelle or better call Jerry is probably better. Um, with no further ado, let's go ahead and let Jerry get started. I will probably uh, finish up towards the end of the presentation. At any time, if you have any questions, by all means, uh, pitch right in. Good afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, the program that I'm prepared to give today is not the one that's loaded on here. So I think rather than run through the slides on the screen, I'm just going to go through my presentation because they won't match. Um, and that's okay. And anyone that wants my presentation, I'd be more than happy to send it to you in a PDF file. And uh, it's going to be kind of fun, hopefully. He has pretty pictures, though, so I'm going to click through just for... Well, the, but the pictures aren't going to match what I'm talking about. But it's okay. <laughs> so in, 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 in any case, uh, in terms of hiring, what you know and logic is not going to get you very far because the law itself does things that, shall we say, are counterintuitive. So as Justice Holmes once wrote, the life of the law has not been logic, and that's the way it is in employment law. So what we need to do is kind of look at what you face on the ground when you're making hiring and recruiting decisions, and then see how the law affects those things. So our big picture view is that the law does prohibit intentional discrimination, and what it does is it protects specific classes, and those classes are based on race, color, age, sex, national origin, citizenship, ancestry, religion, disability, veteran status, family medical history, medical history, or genetic information. As I said, this is not a logic test. So let's start with some questions because they, they may bring some things out that you would face if you're going to be, be making a hiring decision. So here's a true or false question. An employer's First Amendment right to freedom of association allows it to choose the employees with whom it associates for any reason. Anybody want to take a stab at whether that's true or false? First Amendment protects freedom of association in addition to freedom of speech. Don't all volunteer at once. Okay. That is a false statement. And the reason it's a false statement is because Congress has enacted the federal laws that prohibit discrimination, and it has the authority under the Constitution to do that under both for private employers, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, and for public employers under the Equal Protection Clause. Now, you know, let's, let's warm up to the true and false. Let's have some volunteers here. We're, we're going to have one here. Employers can lawfully choose to hire only non-smokers. We're going to have a smoke-free environment. Only non-smokers. Ah, gotcha. It's a depends. And it depends on the state in which you are. 
There are about 30 states that have laws similar to Illinois and Missouri, and in those states like Illinois and Missouri, the law prohibits an employer from taking any adverse action against an employee or, or person that it's considering to hire because of that person's use of legal substances. So uh, as the spread of uh, Colorado and Washington laws on marijuana uh, go to other states, we'll see how that develops. All right, let's try another true and false question. A hospital can recruit only female candidates because its patients prefer female executives. And, and the picture, in case you can't see it, is Brigham and Williams, uh, I'm sorry, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, which specializes in uh, diseases with females. But in any case, can that kind of an institution limit its executives to females? I kind of like the idea, but I'm, I'm sure that it's, that it's false. Well, that's because you can look over my shoulder. <laughs> Well, the answer is false. Customer preference is not a legitimate reason to discriminate against any of the uh, protected classes. So if your customers like young people, that doesn't give you any reason to only hire young people. Let's try another one. True or false, the law requires blind and clueless recruiters and interviewers. So. True or false? Are you sure true or false or opinion? Oh, come on. All right, it's <laughs> false, okay? A, a candidate's membership in a legally protected class, in, in many instances, is a self-evident fact. If you're interviewing someone and that person, you're going to know the person's gender, you're going to know the person's race, you may know the person's national origin. So, you know, just the mere knowledge of membership in a protected class that's something that's going to happen all the time. What the law prohibits is making decisions on the basis of membership in the protected class. So that means employers need to avoid asking questions that essentially come down to asking someone, you know, like, do you have a disability? You may not ask it in that way. In fact, what, um, for example, in the guidelines from the EEOC on the Americans with Disabilities Act, you cannot ask somebody, you know, how many times have you missed uh, work because of illness in the last year? Because that's a question likely to lead to an answer that would identify some kind of disability. However, even the EEOC says that you can say, well, how many times were you not at work? Were you absent for work? You had to leave the four illness off in the last year, and you can use that information. So it's, it's a little bit tricky. The other thing is many times applicants volunteer their membership in a protected class in one way or another. And what uh, gets employers into trouble is if they're writing everything down and suddenly they're writing down things that reveal uh, notes of membership in a protected class it's very hard to explain why someone that's going to be in a decision-making role would have notes reflecting membership in a protected class on an interview note sheet. So that's kind of where you end up on that one. There's also a, a little nuance in the employment laws where you can have a criteria that is used that does not identify a protected class. And so it's what in my line of work is called a neutral selection criteria, but if it produces some kind of discriminatory effect, so you have, you have a job and you know, maybe it's really a low level job and there's not much uh, reading or writing or thinking, it's more just brute labor like, like I, I did in the summers when I was in college as a mover, and I can attest you don't have to do much other than have a strong back for that job. But if they were to set a minimum job requirement for that job of a high school education, that would be a neutral criteria, but it would be one that would screen out a lot of people with strong backs. Because what the statistics show is that a high school diploma is something that disproportionately would favor a white population over a minority population. And so in order to use that kind of neutral criteria, an employer must have some kind of business necessity for using that. So in my example of a high school diploma to be a mover, 
there's no business necessity that a mover have a high school diploma. Just a, a strong back, basically. So let's see how that works. Uh, frequently, where the litigation has gone in these cases, there have been like height and weight requirements. And so let, let's try a question like that. Um, a CEO position can lawfully have a, a height of at least six feet as a job qualification. Is that true or false? False is right. Such a maximum height standard would eliminate about 81% of males, but about 99% of females. And so you would have that disparate effect. Let's try another one, true or false. A CFO's position can lawfully have a CPA, Certified Public Accounting, as a qualification. True or false? True, that's right. Especially for publicly traded companies, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act has the heightened need for financial reporting and internal controls. And that, those, that's the kind of experience and knowledge that CPAs have. All right, let's try another one. And let's not make it quite so stark. So true or false? Leadership ability offers a non-discriminatory reason for choosing a non-minority over a minority candidate. True or false? Say it again. OK. Leadership ability offers a non-discriminatory reason for choosing a non-minority, that will make it easy, for choosing a white guy over a female. OK, in this instance. Again, it depends. All right, and the reason this one is depends is what's the, there are some jobs that require leadership. And so you, ha, you could have the business necessity, depending on what the job is and what its job requirements are, to have leadership ability. So if, if you're going to have a, a position where you, you're going to be leading 50 employees, you, leadership ability is part of that job. Now the question then becomes, how do you determine leadership ability in the interviewing process? And that can be uh, where these things break down a bit because especially if you're not asking the same questions of each candidate to try to get at the leadership ability, you certainly can ask about past experience and leadership roles and what the candidates have done in that position. And if you can identify other specific types of leadership that usually employees progress to, say you're hiring from the outside and in your organization, people usually go through a couple of lower level supervisor jobs before they get to this level, you can see whether the candidate has that kind of experience. Okay. Yes, ma'am. If you have Einstein moving company and you have the employees with Einstein moving company, Okay, the, the question in this instance was, what if you're hiring, say, a mover where really the... In, in that kind of situation where it's not to do the job, it's because of your company's marketing focus. Marketing or customer service slant on a moving business. Let's make sure everyone knows what the question is. The question is, so you are hiring someone, and let's say the basic requirement that is being looked at right now is a high school education. You're hiring someone that's basically physical manual labor. And because you serve a market where there's all these PhDs, you're, I think the example was Boston and Cambridge, and so you're moving them in and out of MIT and Harvard, uh, can you require at least a high school education? And the answer to that question is no, because in what the job responsibilities are, the job responsibilities are to pick up heavy items and carry them out to a truck and stack them in a truck. They're not to carry on an erudite education with the person who's moving. I'm, I'm sorry, I said education, I meant you know conversation, I'm sorry. So that one wouldn't work, but there are others that are much closer calls. So uh, what you have to do sometimes is 
you can start to use one of these neutral criteria, and then you have to measure its effect over time and see whether it disproportionately affects any of the protected minority classifications. And then, then if it does, you better find out whether there is a business necessity for that. Uh, frequently, you'll find there's a, a less restrictive way to get at the same kind of candidates you're trying to get at. So what an employer ultimately wants to do is limit its candidate specifications to the job's essential functions and necessary qualifications. And the essential functions are those that justify the existence of the job. Uh, an employer needs to consider what the effect is of taking away a function of a job from that job to determine if it's essential. If the job is driving, you can't take away driving from the job for a driver. But if the job is something that doesn't require you to drive, so for example, you're hiring an administrative assistant, and you say well, it would be nice for the administrative assistant to have a driver's license because then I can send him or her out to run errands. But that's not really the essential functions of the job. The essential functions are to answer the phone, to do filing, maybe to do some typing, not necessarily run errands. That's a nice thing, an add-on. All right, well then the requirement of a driver's license would not be an essential job function. The necessary qualifications when you're looking at a particular job are those that are the minimum needed to do the job. So when we had the example of the mover and requiring a high school diploma to be a mover, that might be nice to have and you might kind of view it as a plus, but it, it's really not the minimum uh, qualification for that particular job. And that's where employers, when they're going to advertise their job and make hiring decisions, they have to be very aware of what the minimum qualifications are. In addition, in specifying what the job qualifications are, objective criteria should be used if at all possible. For example, a job specification for a CFO could include an experience qualification, such as the following example, at least five years of experience as a partner of a regional or national CPA firm. The other thing that a job in a specification, so like a job description should have, or an advertisement for a job, are the physical and mental demands of the job. For example, the physical and mental demands of plant management positions frequently involve substantially the same characteristics. And those physical things may requ require standing, walking, sitting, the use of hands to finger, handle, or feel objects, tools, or controls, the ability to reach with hands and arms, the ability to climb stairs, uh, good balance, the ability to steep, kneel, crouch, or crawl, the ability to talk and hear, to taste and smell, and the employee must occasionally lift or move, and then whatever the weight minimum is, perhaps 25 pounds for someone in plant management. And then if there are specific vision requirements, whatever those vision requirements are. And usually in a, some kind of a management position, you would also want it to say something about the ability to think analytically and strategically and to communicate effectively. I'm going to interject here real quick, just because I feel like I'm getting left out. Ah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I've been quiet until now because you don't have a workers' compensation claim unless and until you have an employee. And we're talking about hiring employees and vetting the employee candidate pool. So what Jerry was just talking about is a min minimum qualification, a candidate description for an interview process or a job description to hire someone, correct? But it should be the same during employment. Okay. You should be using the same job description for hiring, for evaluating, and determining whether performance is adequate. Okay. So how important <clears throat> a job description then becomes from a work comp perspective is also uh, something that we regularly ask our clients for when it comes to um, deciding whether or not what this employee is testifying to that they do on a daily basis is actually indeed what they were a hired to do, b are doing, or if that job has changed. It's also very important when it comes to getting a medical causation opinion. And having that job description 
accurate, up to date, and um, in that employee file is, is really critical. So we see it often with an, maybe a laborer, someone who's been with a company for 30 to 40 years, and you ask that employee in deposition, has your job changed? And they're going to say, well, no, my job hasn't changed in the last 30 to 40 years. This is what I do. But technically, it probably has over the years, <coughs> and that, that job description probably needed to be updated, either with technology, tool advancements, um, measuring things. Um, and technology changes, the job changes, um, maybe even the physical description of that employee employment position has changed over the years. So remembering to update those not only for your prospective employees, but for your, your current employees when they change um, positions within the company or um, their, maybe their title remains the same, but the job description itself changes. So knowing when an employee is doing a job and what that job description was at the time they were doing it from a work comp perspective can be extremely helpful. Ditto throughout employment. Okay. So when it comes to interviews of employees, there is two distinct challenges. The first is the employer needs to gather the information necessary to identify qualified candidates who will meet the employer's expectations. And then the second challenge is the employer must avoid asking questions or making any comments that could create suspicions of the use of unlawful criteria for making the decision in hiring. So, the key thing is, or obviously, avoid questions that are likely to produce information related to a candidate's protected class, and I won't go through all those again. And then you go, well, what is it you should question candidates about? Well, you question them about things that, in theory, are going to give you some information upon which to base your hiring decision. So you look at the job's essential functions and you review those with each employee and you ask the employee, can you do that? Have you done that in the past? And explain the situations in which you've performed those or give me at least an example of that. Then you would also want to be explaining what the physical and mental requirements of the job are to each applicant. You would ask the applicant specific questions about his or her ability to do the job's essential functions. And then each candidate should be describing previous experience performing similar duties to those involved for the position for which you're hiring. Finally, it is perfectly fine to ask employees about personal preferences. So you may have a job where the duties are something the employee's done, but maybe the employee doesn't really like doing those things. It's pretty good information to learn at the job interview is whether the employee likes to do that kind of thing because it's not going to be a good match if the employee doesn't like them. And there's nothing unlawful about asking questions that would get to whether the employee likes doing the kind of job duties that the job has. When the decision is made to do the hiring, what the employer needs to be doing is evaluating the candidates on the basis of the information gathered through things like the application form, the questions that were answered during the job interviews. And it's important to be using the same criteria and gathering the same kinds of information from all of the applicants so that you don't end up with a situation where you can't compare one applicant to another applicant because in each interview you just winged it and you asked different questions in each one. So having a script for interviews is a very good idea. Once you're in the process, you should be checking with things like references. And you can contact references. Uh, the question is whether they will answer your questions. But one way to increase the likelihood that former employers and perhaps uh, other associates of the applicant will answer questions is on the job application form, there should be a release as part of the wording above where the employee signs that essentially gives former employers and associates and educational institutions uh, a release of liability for anything that they say in response to the hiring employer's inquiries. As I said, sometimes those work and sometimes they don't. 
Uh, most people applying for a job are certainly going to sign that, and if you have a standard practice of rejecting all applications that the employees don't sign, we're going to have them for everyone. So then it becomes whether the institutions and organizations to which you're sending that release will honor it. And the kinds of questions that you'd want to be asking former employers would be things of, about the applicant's level of skill and ability, uh, the person's honesty, interpersonal skills, initiative, attendance, cooperation, whether that candidate is eligible for rehire by the former employer, and whether there were any violent or abusive tendencies evident in that employee when employed by the former employer. How often do you think that that, that type of questioning is actually going on, though, to a former employer? Well, I would say that it's not going on nearly often enough, uh, but you'd be surprised how much information you can get if you actually make the effort and do it. If I you, feel like more often than not you hear, was this person an employee during this time and would you rehire them? And that's kind of the extent of what I understand is generally asked. Those are good questions to ask. I was going to say, shame, shame on who's ever asking the questions <laughs> if that's all that's being asked. Okay. The only thing to avoid are the protected class questions. And as long as you avoid them, you can ask anything and everything. Again, you may not get answers to anything and everything. But then you will have two sources of information. You will have sources of information from the applicants, and you also have sources of information from these former employers and maybe educational institutions. So you want to see if the information is consistent. And to the extent it is not consistent, then you need to circle back to the applicant and ask the applicant to explain the inconsistency. Now, if possible, you're going to want to find a way to verify the explanation. And if there's no explanation, it's kind of like those, you get the application form and there's a gap. Uh, if that means that person was incarcerated for five years, that's maybe important information to have. So those are the kinds of things that you want to be confronting the applicant with. And you eliminate any applicant that has an unsatisfactory explanation. So generally, to generalize how this all works, we can say that you can minimize the liability risk by avoiding the collection of information that you cannot lawfully use for a hiring decision. And employers cannot lawfully use the protected class status of a candidate as a selection criteria. They also cannot select candidates on the basis of a neutral criteria if it produces discriminatory results unless there is some business necessity for using that neutral criteria. Most of those business necessity ones come, if there is a requirement by law, so in order for you to be an interstate truck driver, um, there are certain things you have to be able to qualify for and you have to have a certain kind of license. Certainly those are fine to have as job requirements and they're not discriminatory to use them. And remember that employers can lawfully select candidates on the basis of work-related experience, qualifications, and preferences. Now, I want to make sure that we get all the way through. So I think why don't we, I was going to go into, and we can get back to it if we have time, but the use of the internet in the hiring process. It poses all kinds of interesting questions, many of which uh, employers have found to be problematic. But I think it's important to make sure that Michelle gets through I'm going to skip part. ahead. If you can kind of take a little mental um, break, I'm going to scan through some slides if you want to look somewhere else so I don't, you know, make you dizzy. No, it's, it's all right. You can, you can look at all those and go, wow, that must be interesting. It, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, Real quick. His are exciting. Mine are boring. But I wanted to bring this back around a little bit to a couple of areas where work comp and employment law meet again. And it's typically on after they're hired, after they're an employee, and after that employee gets injured at work. And so TTD and unemployment. When you, 
The statute provides that if an em that employee is disqualified from receiving TTD during any time period in which he applies and receives unemployment comp compensation. Seems very straightforward, but it's helpful as a work comp defense attorney to know when that actually happens. So, you know, to, to be able to assert that credit or terminate TTD if we can find out quickly enough, that's information that you would want to share between your em employment in-house person and your work comp administrator, your TPA, or your attorney. Um, and those things I'm sure Jerry, Jerry can attest to as well. Um, TTD and FMLA. Recently, the question came up in the office, can I run FMLA and TTD concurrently? And the answer is yes. The employer can run FMLA and TTD concurrently. During that 12-week period where a person is eligible for FMLA for a serious health condition, that suspense. person is running down that FMLA clock. Well, we on the work comp side are paying out TTD. My goal is to bring that person back to work, get them back to work on some sort of a restricted duty program, ensure that there's a position there for them, so when they are released to return to work, I'm not now dealing with someone who doesn't have a job to return to and facing greater uh, potential liability. But that goes hand in hand with the company's decision regarding FMLA and whether or not they want to have a position open for this person after that time period expires. So these implications, while they don't always come up, you know, when it does, that's probably a, a, a big picture question that you'll want to review with your trusted advisor, whether it, you know, it's Jerry or myself or whoever you pick up and ask those sorts of questions. What will making this decision today do down the road or even as soon as tomorrow? And I wanted to real quickly go over some post-accident misconduct because some of these questions might be, uh, you know, a straight employment law question or it might be a workers' compensation question. So we can terminate TTD when there is post-injury misconduct. And the case law pretty much suggests that that misconduct must be found in the employee handbook. When Jerry referenced logic or common sense earlier, we kind of see that in this area too. Now. There's an example, Glenda Buchanan versus SRG Global. This is a woman who filed an occupational disease claim. So her date of injury is a little unclear as to you know, a, a finite date um, in, in time. But her personnel file contained her termination slip and some write-up warnings. You would think that that would be sufficient. She clearly had the last absenteeism problem after this claim was filed. Well, when the commission looked at the case, the documentation, it wasn't sufficient. They weren't convinced that all of the misconduct occurred after the injury and that the reason that she was terminated occurred after the date of the injury. Well, whether or not that qualified her to be terminated is an employment law question, which has nothing to do really with her workers' compensation claim. But if you're looking at post-injury misconduct and wanting to terminate those TTD benefits, that's a different question. When in time did she have the injury, and did that conduct occur after the injury, and is that sufficient enough to terminate her? So you may have gotten rid of a bad employee, but you may not be able to terminate TTD. So those two questions are kind, you know, they kind of overlap, but they may be separate results that you know, may not make you really happy, but you know, they, may, they may go hand in hand and they may not. So they're two separate inquiries. <clears throat> and then I, I wanted to revisit this. We, we had this Temple Meyer case come down right before the uh, seminar last year. It was issued April 15th, so three weeks later, here we are in this, in this room talking about what this is going to be, what's this going to mean. And Temple Meyer was a retaliatory discharge claim that went up to the Missouri Supreme Court. The Missouri C Supreme Court overturned, overruled, prior case law, which stated that the case, the case is required a showing that the employee's exercise of workers' compensation rights was the exclusive cause of the discharge or discrimination. So instead of now it requiring an exclusive cause to terminate someone, the, the court decided that exercise of workers' compensation rights was a contributing factor to the employee's discharge. So we were concerned at that point, does anyone who file files a workers' compensation claim have protection from being terminated down the road. And it was, a, it was a legitimate concern at the time. We kind of had already been seeing some 
some letters, some reference to this Templemeyer decision, even three weeks after the decision came down. Well, you know, Jerry and I have talked about it. And yes, the law says that discrimination because of exercising your compensation rights is prohibited. What is this actually going to look like in real life? And Jerry reminded me that, you know, this isn't an administrative tribunal. This is a, it's going to be a civil case. It's a jury trial. And, and can, the question will be, can the employer truthfully testify that the exclusive reason for the termination was not because of the workers' compensation claim? And if that question is yes, you're probably okay. But some considerations that you might need to take into account are how close in time to the filing of the claim was this person terminated? How egregious was the action or the misconduct in relation to the knowledge of the workers' compensation claim? So I think that the example that you used was th three weeks after someone files a workers' compensation claim, they're caught stealing a bag of chips and they're terminated. What do you think? What do I think? Yeah, Mr. Jury. <laughs> well, it's, I, I think an employer would have a very hard time defending that claim. Uh, one, you have to put yourself in the shoes of jurors. Yeah. Jurors are not people who make supervisory decisions. Jurors tend to be people who have no good excuse not to sit on a jury and think that $15 a day is a pretty good day's work. So uh, those people are going to look at that and say, a 69 cent bag of potato chips is no reason to fire somebody. And they're not gonna care what your reason is or what your explanation is. They're gonna say it's unfair. And if the people in the jury box think that the employee was treated unfairly, the employer loses. So. But let's say this, the same person, uh, three years after the workers' compensation claim, walks up to the supervisor and socks him in the nose and is terminated. Mr. Uh, Jury, what say you? Well, three years is a long enough period of time. I think you have a fighting chance to explain that the workers' comp claim, nobody even at that point remembered. And it was not part. And I think you, you may be able to sell that. And I don't think a whole lot of plaintiff's lawyers, if there's that much time between the last exercise of workers' compensation rights and the termination are going to think that they're going to retire on that case. But when you, it's more interesting when you get closer in time. So I'm thinking six months, and in that six months period. And let, let's face it, usually the people that are the decision makers in a termination case are aware of someone's workers' compensation claim because they're the supervisor. That person was gone from work for a while and <laughs> they knew it was workers' comp. Uh, you don't even have to have actually filed a claim, you know, the formal claim process. If you're complaining of a work-related injury, that's enough. Even if the employer doesn't believe the employee, that's an exercise of rights. So this stuff is dynamite. I, this is what I deal with in all kinds of employment discrimination and re retaliatory discharge claims. And I keep track of how employers do in jury trial results in Missouri on these kinds of cases. And employers lose about 64% of the time if they go to trial. Those aren't real good odds, folks. Doesn't mean you can't ever win, but it's starting to look like lightning striking. So the key is to try to not end up in front of that jury. And I know if you've come to a couple of the presentations or seminars in the past, we were talking a lot about um, the internet, various investigative tools, Facebook, social media, things of that nature. And um, you know, it, it has become a tool that I use with regularity. It's an effective tool, and it's it's something that really can be useful when people are out there sharing their thoughts and their locations and their plans and their vacation photos with the world. It is very useful. Um, you know, some of the pitfalls or uh, I guess words of caution in in hiring people 
as opposed to just investigating them after a workers' compensation claim is filed, um, is something that I want to give Jerry a, a second to talk about because it is a whole new world and we do use it, um, but that's after the person is an employee and after they've filed the claim and after we're investigating them for a reason. Go ahead. Well, and, and I think the sh in, in looking at the internet, whether it's in the context of hiring or employment, it's fraught with dangers for employers to use the information that's there. There are certain circumstances when it's not, but uh, the most common way that employers get into trouble and that I read about them in the, what the lawyers call advance sheets, so the cases that are coming down, is because they have done something that they thought, hey, there's nothing wrong with doing this, and it turned out that it was. So maybe one way to look at that uh, uh, again, um, are some true false questions. So how about, must job applicants or employees give their social media usernames and passwords to employers if asked to do so? So you come in and I'm gonna interview you and I say, well give me your Facebook username and password. True or false? Ah, depends is the answer. <laughs> there are states where that would get you into deep doo-doo. And in fact, there are 16 of them. And all the states with those license plates on that slide are where an employer cannot require an employee or a job applicant to disclose, either one, a username and password. But in the rest of the states, it's fair game. Now, I do a fair amount of consulting with employers all the time, and I've yet to run into one that, that this is a hot topic for interviewing, that is I want your Facebook username and password. But in any case, a couple of years ago, this was um, kind of what the state legislatures were all doing, was enacting these laws. It's kind of slowed down for now. Uh, the first ones had no exceptions. The later laws, um, and Illinois was the first state that amended the law that it passed, but it created basically exceptions for public safety employers, employers whose employees must satisfy regulatory requirements like those in the securities industry, employers conducting an investigation of workplace misconduct, and an exception for accounts maintained by the employers for its business purpose. So if the employer has its own Facebook account or LinkedIn account, and the employee uses that. Let's try another true or false question. An employer can use a fake Facebook identity to friend an employee and then lawfully gain access to the employee's or co-worker's Facebook postings. True or false? What do you think? Well, well the answer is <laughs> false, and the reason it's, it's false is there is a law, and it's a federal law passed long before the Internet was even thought of, and it's called the Stored Communications Act. And the Stored Communications Act prohibits anyone from intentionally interfering with an electronically stored, electronically stored information. And guess what? Facebook is up on the internet and it's stored electronically. And so there was, there was a case on this that was an arbitration case and the arbitrator ruled that the employer can't you know, create bogus accounts and do this kind of thing. So that's where that comes from. Um, let's try another true and false. An employer may lawfully base disciplinary action on an unsolicited sharing of an employee's Facebook posting by one of her Facebook friends. Let's put friends in quotation marks, I guess. So, some, some employee says that uh, Michelle, she really posted bad stuff, Mr. Supervisor, about you. And so, I'm one of her friends, so here, let me show it to you. And then I fire Michelle because she did say bad things about me. Is that, you know, something that is doable or not doable by the employer? Well, the answer... Well, the, the comment is there, there was a HIPAA bar. You, you, you know, depending, you know, you could have HIPAA problems if there's HIPAA information and if you are covered by HIPAA. Employers generally are not covered by HIPAA unless they have their own medical plan and they're administering that, but most employers don't. So, but anyway, let's not go into HIPAA. But 
in, in terms of somebody who had legitimate access to this Facebook information and then without the consent of the person that posted it, then giving it to the employer, well, the employer didn't go looking for that. The employer didn't do anything wrong, and the employer can use that information. And there's also case law on that. So that's kind of, kind of interesting. So let, let's look at this in a, a slightly different context. What about an employer? Uh, can it lawfully use computer forensics? So that's, let's say, the employer gives a laptop to an employee during employment, gets the laptop back after the employee leaves, and then brings it to the computer tech guys and says, let's take a look at that hard drive and see what's on that hard drive. <laughs> can the employer lawfully use forensics or other techniques to recover emails from an employee's private email account that she opened on her company-issued laptop? So let's say you use like, oh, yahoo.com or any, any one of the other internet-based internet uh, emails. And if you open that, and if you don't clean out your history, that stuff gets left on your hard drive that you looked at. And not everybody realizes that or they forget about that. And that's what was happening in these cases. And in, in one case, the employer found all this all these communications by email between the former employee and her lawyer about the sex discrimination claim she was going to file as soon as she quit. And so the employer wanted to use that as evidence in the sex discrimination case. So can the employer do that? Well, not lawfully the employer cannot is what the courts have said. So. Um, there are a couple of cases, and in both instances, one, the employer had a policy that essentially said, if we give you a laptop, anything and everything you put on the laptop, you give us consent to look at. So it had what, in my line of work, is known as kind of a bulletproof policy. The New Jersey Court of Appeals said, no, it's not bulletproof. That's bogus. We're not going to allow you to do that. Uh, and then the other was the Fourth Circuit, which is a US Court of Appeals that sits in Richmond, Virginia. And there was no policy that authorize the employer to examine anything on the laptop of the employee. And the Fourth Circuit basically said that the employer doesn't have that right. All right, we can try another, or are we out of time? Know. Lauren? Are we right? OK, are well, there any questions before one more sure. true false? Like, when's the bar going to open? Yeah. Was that a hand? No. OK, one more true false. All right, let's try this. True or false, an employer cannot lawfully fire non-union at will employees who write or reply to social media posts complaining about sweatshop conditions because of dirty restrooms and inadequate air conditioning. Gosh, my car said it was 90 degrees today, so we'll be complaining about inadequate air conditioning. So is that true or false? Well, that, that is true. The employer cannot fire, even though there's no union and even though it's just an at-will employee. The National Labor Relations Act protects protected concerted activity in the non-union workplace. And if employees are complaining about working conditions, supervisors, uh, wages, anything like that, that's protected activity under the National Labor Relations Act. What was that NLRB decision that just you were just talking about? Well, I was, I was telling Michelle that only last week there was an interesting one where on Facebook an employee had um, talked about the effing this and effing that supervisor, and, but then concluded the remark with vote union. And that really saved that employee because he got fired, but the uh, NLRB, in its wisdom, found that the employer's rule that prohibited the use of profanities in the workplace and by employees about other em employees uh, was not something that could be used when the employee was engaged in protected activity, which is vote union, uh, to fire someone. So it's an interesting world. Yeah.